We covered some pretty high-level genetic science in the first video. Now we're going to do an interactive activity to illustrate why genetics is so important to wildlife conservation. But let's start with some vocabulary. The characteristics of an individual animal that we can observe, such as its physical appearance or behavior, are what we call its phenotype. For example, your eye color is part of your phenotype. It's a characteristic or trait that can be observed. The phenotype of an animal is mostly determined by what we call the genotype. We can't see or observe an individual's genotype directly, so we rely on special genetic technology that allows us to read the unique pattern of genes found on an individual's chromosomes. A genotype is made up of the DNA that an animal inherits from its two parents. Now is your chance to think about how the phenotypes of wolves are different from those of dogs. I've already mentioned some of these differences in the first video, so this will really test your knowledge. After I finish reading the phenotype traits, I want you to howl if you think it describes a wolf trait or bark if you think it describes a dog trait. Okay, prepare your howls and your barks. Does the dog or the wolf have a narrower chest? I hope you're howling. See how the dog's chest is wider? Which one has shorter and thicker legs? That's right. Dog's legs are shorter and thicker and their paws are smaller. Which one has very furry ears? You got it. Just look how furry the wolf's ears are. Which one is fearful of humans? Dogs are generally friendly towards humans and that's why they make such great companions. I hope that was fun and I hope you're getting the idea that all living things have DNA. And what's in that DNA determines the organism's observable traits or characteristics. Jolene's genotype, her DNA, is a mixture of genes she inherited from her two parents. And those genes determine her phenotype, her black fur, her white paws, her easy disposition, and all that drooling. I have one more activity to help you understand why all of this matters in wildlife conservation. For this activity, you will need the worksheet and some dice. If you don't have any dice, you can use an online number generator. If you're working in a group, you should work in pairs. But if you're alone, you can also play this activity. You'll just take turns being each of the two parents. Are you ready? We're going to mix up our genes and create some imaginary wolf pups. There are just two wolf species that we know of on Earth right now. But let's pretend I discovered a whole new species of wolves. But it's a very small population, no bigger than your class. This is a totally make-believe population of wolves that I invented. So let's just call this particular wolf species, oh, hmm, I don't know, the Daria wolf. Using the worksheet, you will work in pairs, roll some dice, and use a chart to help you determine how the numbers you roll, and whether they're odd or even, will determine the traits of your pups. Remember, the phenotype of each wolf pup is determined by a mix of genes it will get from each parent. Follow the directions on the worksheet and meet me back here when you have your pup's phenotypes. By now you should know that all living things have DNA. An animal's DNA contains a mixture of genes from its parents, and it's a unique mixture of DNA that determines the animal's traits. This activity will help you understand why all that variation matters. Because in nature, the long-term survival of a species is directly related to the diversity of its members. More diversity in the DNA means a greater variety of traits, and that means a better chance that there will be individual wolves with traits that match the current environment. The environment is always changing, and we don't want every animal to be the same. Let me show you why. Here are three different scenarios that I made up for our imaginary population of Daria wolves but they are based on actual scenarios that can happen in nature with wildlife populations. Now, each of you represents a unique wolf pup that has grown up and is living its best life, just trying to survive out there in the world. You should know what type of fur, eyes, and behavior you have based on how you rolled the dice, a random process that determined which traits were passed down to you from your parents' DNA. But before I read this, Raise your hands or give a thumbs up to represent that you are alive and vibing out there in your wolf habitat. Keep your hands up and let's see what happens with this first scenario. Here we go. So, you're all just out there surviving until, unfortunately, 
one of these three scenarios happened. Let's see what happens with scenario one. The Daria wolves have been living in peace on a remote mountain for centuries. But because of climate change, rising sea levels, and extreme weather events, humans have been losing their homes near the coastline. And they have begun to build new homes on a mountain. The humans are afraid of the Daria wolves and they've started hunting them at night when the wolves are most active. Only the wolves with dark gray or black fur are able to blend into the darkness and survive. If you have black or dark gray fur, keep your hands up. Otherwise, I'm sorry, but you didn't make it through this scenario. The humans were scared of you and hunted you to death. Okay, that was sad, but let's try another scenario. Everyone, put your hands up again. We're all out here alive and vibing in our natural habitat. This time, let's see what we've got. Oh no, a terrible disease carried by mosquitoes is spreading through the population. For some reason, only wolves with orange eyes are able to survive because orange-eyed wolves also carry a resistance to the disease. In this scenario, only the wolves with orange eyes live. Hopefully in your classroom, there are at least a few wolves that have the orange eyes to carry on the population. Did anyone make it? Are you starting to understand why diversity is so important? If all the wolves are exactly the same, a small population could be easily wiped out by a sudden change in conditions, like these scenarios. The more genetic diversity we have, the more trait diversity we see in the wolves, and the better chances that some wolves will be a good match for whatever environmental challenge occurs. I have one last scenario to test. Are you ready? Everyone, put your hands back up. Once again, the wolves are all coexisting in their habitat when their favorite food, dryer rabbits, begins to disappear, making hunting a difficult task, even for the strongest, most experienced wolves. With food very scarce on the mountain, wolves must rely on the leftover food scraps that humans leave behind or toss their way after they had their meals. But humans are very scared of orange-eyed wolves and will kill them if they get too close. In this challenge, you have to be a wolf without orange eyes who is either friendly or very friendly in order to survive. So, put your hands down if your wolf has orange eyes or if your wolf has a fearful or very fearful behavior phenotype. By the way, that last scenario is similar to what happened when early humans favored wolf traits that made wolves appear less dangerous to people when they began to domesticate them. This resulted in the various dog breeds we have today. Ideally, we never want another species to go extinct. When that happens, the whole planet suffers. But studying the DNA from extinct species can teach us a lot about species that are still alive. So, how can we use genetic code from extinct species to save endangered ones? Think about the extinct woolly mammoth. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, woolly mammoths were a thriving species in the frozen tundras of North America, Europe, and Asia. Overhunting by humans and drastic changes in climate caused them to go extinct. But their frozen bodies buried deep in the ice contain ancient DNA samples we can collect and study. And the woolly mammoth DNA is 99.6% the same as elephants living today. Scientists are looking for ways to use woolly mammoth genes to help strengthen elephants' DNA and save them from extinction. Elephants are a keystone species and critical to the biodiversity of their entire ecosystem. Technological innovation, like using ancient DNA, is opening up so many new ways we can help protect our planet. It might sound impossible, but what if we could use genetics to bring back an extinct species? An ecosystem suffers when a species goes extinct, but how would it help an ecosystem to bring back a species? It's a concept called de-extinction using science to bring back an organism that was once extinct. And don't worry, it's not like Jurassic Park. That's just a movie. You can't really bring back a dinosaur. They went extinct too long ago. Sorry, Velociraptors. The work we're doing isn't sci-fi, but we are thinking big, and saving the planet requires big ideas and new ways of thinking about conservation. Okay, now that you have some background, let's get back into the lab, where I'm gonna show you how I work. Welcome to the Colossal Lab. Let's go on a little lab tour. Follow me. Let's start 
the beginning. Here's where we start doing all of our biobanking. What is biobanking though? Biobanking is a collection of biological samples, like DNA, that can be used for research. We can freeze this genetic information to use later, and we can do it in a way that doesn't damage the genetic code. At Colossal, we're building the world's largest biobank, aimed at preserving the genetic code of the world's most imperiled species. When those samples arrive, they go to our engineering lab, where a team of skilled scientists take those tissue samples and drive protocols in order to generate cell lines. Those cell lines could then be used later on to clone animals. We can freeze this genetic information to use later, and we can do it in a way that doesn't damage the genetic code. Cloning is an important way that we can increase population sizes of endangered species, and we can improve genetic diversity at the same time. At Colossal, once we finish up with generating those cell lines, we then put them into our bio vault, and that's where we store all of the genetic codes in terms of cells. Let's take a look. We have hundreds of samples at Colossal from different species and different individuals, so we have the most amount of genetic diversity. All of those cell lines are stored in these boxes, and it lets us use them at any point when we need to reintroduce the species back into the wild. The other way that we do biobanking at Colossal is by freezing gametes. So I'm gonna take you in the little lab tour to my area where we're gonna freeze some embryos. And you can see what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. To start with, we're gonna need some liquid nitrogen. As a reproductive biologist, part of my job is also generating embryos, and through embryos we can introduce genetic diversity. So I've already got some embryos growing in culture right now, and I'm going to show you what I do to freeze them, and that's our other way of doing biobanking. So what we need to do first is we need to prep a vessel, and we use liquid nitrogen to do that because we want to freeze it as fast as possible with the lowest temperature possible. So I'm going to use some gloves, and I'm going to pour in liquid nitrogen that we just got. Now that I've got this ready, I gotta work really fast. I wanna be sure that I'm not ruining these embryos and freeze them as fast as possible. They live in this thing called an incubator. This lets me mimic development for a certain time period. I'm going to put them in some special vials that we call cryovials. They let us freeze without damaging the cells that we're putting into them. And that's it, that's all it takes to freeze our embryos. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna store these embryos so that when we wanna produce another actual animal, we just thaw them out, and with the help of our field team, we put them back into another female, and fingers crossed, we get an offspring on the ground. Cloning is an important way that we can increase population size in endangered species and introduce biodiversity and allow their ecosystem to thrive. But for now, let's get out of here and let my coworkers thrive in their environment. Bye, Chris. Bye, Daria. Diversity makes our world better. Diversity in nature keeps an ecosystem healthy. And a balanced ecosystem is key to saving endangered species. We've been talking a lot about diversity in the animal kingdom and in an ecosystem. But let's think about other types of diversity. We need diversity in conservation too. I work with people from all over the world and that makes my work better. We need people from different backgrounds and different places. We need people who think in different ways and bring new ideas and perspectives to science. We even need people who like to wake up early, like Taylor here. She's a conservationist who wakes up at 3 a.m. to observe wolves. Now that's early. We need Rosie, who works closely with the Nez Perce tribe on wolf reintroduction efforts. Both Taylor and Rosie are a part of Conservation Nation and are helping to build a more diverse and inclusive conservation field. And 
we all need people like you to help us. Students have some of the most innovative ideas about how to make our world better. There are so many ways you can get involved in helping save endangered wildlife and increase biodiversity right in your own community. When I was about your age, I volunteered at an animal shelter, helping educate people about raccoons. Did I mention I also love raccoons? Some people are afraid of raccoons. They do have a habit of eating out of trash cans when people don't store their garbage properly. Human food and trash attract wild animals, and that can be dangerous for humans and wildlife. Learning about animals is the first step in not fearing them. Here are three things you can do today to help support biodiversity. Encourage your family or school to compost leftover food scraps. Can be put back into the soil instead of in a landfill. Learn about local wildlife in your community. Wildlife is everywhere, even in big cities. Noticing birds is a great way to start. Reduce your impact on the environment by using less stuff, especially plastic products. I have one more challenge for you. You've seen examples of diversity in wildlife and diversity in people who work in conservation and science. How would you draw a scientist? We'd love to see your pictures and hear what conservation means to you. If you want to learn more, and I hope you do, keep exploring with the Conservation Nation Academy and never give up on your dreams. Maybe someday you'll be a part of our de-extinction team here at Colossal.